Today we have a different topic. It's not a coding challenge. Instead, I'm going to show you how to convert a decimal number to octal formats. So for this, I need to get to this online converter instead of having 10 digits like we do, you know, in the decimal format. Uh, this time around, you have up to eight. So example, if you pass a number like three here to convert, this is from rapidtables.com, you will get the same number in octal, as an octal, right? But if you pass a number like um, eight itself, then now you get something different because eight is the limit. If you pass a larger number like 150, then you get a different number as well. Now, how exactly does this work? Before I enter my code in Visual Studio right here, and we're going to complete this function, currently it's empty, what we are going to do is scroll down and look at the logic for the conversion. Now, of course, this here is going to be in C++, and there are already formatters out there that you can use, and there are other optimized methods of going about this. But the point of this video is for you guys to understand the logic behind the conversion so that you can write your own algorithms based on logic. And because this channel is beginner friendly, we're not really looking at optimizing the code in terms of performance. So here I'm rather looking at the logic. It has to make sense and we need to be able to convert really large numbers because then I'm going to try with some very large numbers at the end of this video. So here, let's say I pass 150, like I did at the top here. What is happening is that we're going to run into an iterative process, meaning we're going to have a loop in the background and we're going to divide the initial number, the decimal number by eight. When we divide that number, we're gonna grab the quotient. We're gonna have a quotient, definitely. So we're going to get a remainder as well, Possibly, sometimes it's going to be zero, other times we're going to have a, a different digit. So we're going to grab that remainder. And then at the next iteration, so long as the quotient is not zero, we're going to grab that and divide that by eight. So again, we're going to get a new quotient and we're going to get a remainder. So because this quotient is not zero, we're going to take that, try and divide it by eight. The quotient is going to be zero and the remainder is going to be the original number because you cannot divide two by eight and get a whole number. So let's confirm again the logic here. These are the conversion steps, what you see here. And that's what rapidtables.com is using because this is basically the standard of how it works. So you get a number, right? A decimal number. You divide that number by eight. Then you get the integer quotient for the next iteration. You get the remainder for the octal digits and you repeat that step until the quotient is equal to zero. Now, remember that here, when we grab the decimal number, we divided it by eight, we got the quotient and so on. The remainders here were being stored. So here you see six, two, and two. You have to reverse that to get your final answer. The final answer here is two, two, six, base eight. So again here, when I typed 150, I got two, two, six. I'm going to give you guys another example. If I type a number like 6,000, maybe 68,786, I'm going to click on convert. We get 206262. In here, you get 262602. Now you're supposed to get that in reverse format to get this answer. So 206, that's what they have here, 206, and then 2. And, and here they have six, and here they have two, so two, six, two. And that is the final answer. So let's now go back to Visual Studio, and we're going to code that. So first I have a main function, and I'm using long, long integers here, because like I said, I want to be able to test my solutions with really large numbers. For example, trillions, quadrillions, or even quintillions. Now my program is going to run as a while loop, I'm using a while loop here, not because it's necessary for the conversion in this case, but because I want to be able to compute these test cases on the go. I don't want to have to close the program, reopen it, add some input and so on. So here what's going to happen is that the program is going to prompt us to key in some inputs as a decimal number. We're going to do that. And then once we get the answer quickly, we're going to be prompted again to add another digit to convert this number. 
and then this one and this one. So we can do that without closing the program all the time because it's actually a continuous loop. So now that we have our while loop here, we're going to grab some inputs that is going to be the decimal number. Then we're going to pass that input to our function, which we are going to complete right here. The name of the function is decimal to octal. I named it like that because I think it's straightforward. I'm going to pass my decimal value here, my long, long integer. I'm going to pass that to my function and then get the result as a string. So here for this algorithm, like I said, I'm because I'm coding the whole thing myself from scratch, I'm using a string data type so that I can easily append the digits to it and then reverse my whole string at the end. So um, I'm then going to print the octal digits, the final answer. I'm going to go to the next line and then I'm adding this just for presentation. Then I'm going to start again, add a new digit and so on. All right, so now, because we know that we're dealing with long, long integers, our function also needs to accept long, long integer values. So here my parameter is called num for number and it's a long, long type. We're going to return the string, which is going to be the string representation of our octal answer. First thing that we're going to do is check, first of all, if the number that we are passing to the function, the number that we are receiving in the function is less than or equal to eight. If it is, then we need to return that number as a string without even modifying it. And to explain to you why we are using that logic, let's try and key in negative seven. The answer is exactly the same as the input because when we try to divide negative seven by eight, our quotient is zero, meaning that we only have one iteration for that. And because we always store the remainder at every iteration, the remainder here is seven. So we return seven with the negative sign because the input was a negative number. So we return seven and we're done. Same thing if I pass a positive number less than eight, for example, um, number two, I convert that and I also get number two. Because if you scroll down here, we only have one iteration, the quotient was zero and the remainder was two. Even though, like I said, we need to reverse the remainder or the list of remainders. In this case, we only have a single digit as the remainder. We don't have a list of digits. So whether you reverse it or not is the same thing. Um, basically what I'm saying is that you don't need to reverse anything. You just return the input as is. So that's what is happening here. We return that input without changing it if it meets this condition here. The next thing is to create our variables. So for this algorithm, all the variables have to be of long, long integer type because the, the parameter is of long, long type and the output is also going to be a long, long converter to a string. So here we need a remainder for every iteration. We also need a quotient. And I'm going to explain to you guys why I need this variable. This one here is for me to add a negative sign if necessary at the end of my computation. And then here I have decimal. It's going to be the same thing as the parameter here, but I'm passing it to the ABS function. Now, the reason why I'm using ABS is because I want the inputs as an absolute value. Whether it's negative or not, I want to treat it as a positive value, even when it's negative. Like I said here, if you pass negative five, for example, notice that when they compute here, when they do five divided by eight, they're not doing negative five divided by eight. They are only treating the inputs as a, as a digit by itself without a negative sign. They grab the remainder, but they add negative sign to the final answer. So we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to treat it as a positive value, even if the input is negative. And then I'm going to check from my original value here if it was a negative number or not. And if it was, then I'm going to add back my negative sign. Now we need to create the string that is going to hold the final answer. I'm calling that string octal. And at first it's an empty string. Now I have a while loop to process the conversion. And this is basically what is converting the decimal number to an octal. So notice here, again, when we looked at the logic here, let's say I pass a number like 5,964, we have a loop. And at every iteration, we grab the quotient, we store the remainder, and so on. 
we're doing the same thing here. So long as the quotient is greater than or equal to eight, then we can process the conversion. Now you might be wondering why I don't have quotient here and instead I have decimal is because at first we're gonna grab the decimal value, the one that we received from our parameter here that we converted to an absolute value. We're gonna grab that at first and then we're going to proceed by dividing it by eight. So this will give us the quotient, which is automatically truncated because it's an integer and integers cannot hold digits after a decimal point. They are just whole numbers. Let's say decimal is 10. If you do 10 divided by eight, you're gonna get 1.25, I think. But due to the truncation, the decimal number and the digits after it are gonna get deleted. So here we're gonna get one as a single digit. And I'm going to store that inside of quotient. But here, notice that I'm then passing the value of quotient to decimal. So at the next iteration, decimal here is actually the quotient. I'm only using decimal here because at the very first iteration, we need to pass the original value, that is the inputs. So we pass decimal, but then inside of the loop, you update the value of decimal to be equal to the quotient. In other words, you assign the value of the quotient to the variable decimal. We also need to get the remainder, of course. So to get a remainder, we simply use the modulo operator, and this will give us a remainder which we store here. And once we get it, we append it to our octal string. But remainder is of long, long type. So we need to use the toString function to convert it to a string before we append it to our string octal. Lastly, remember that this while loop will only run so long as the quotient that we had or the original inputs in case it's a small number, so long as that value is greater than or equal to eight. If the value of decimal is something like five, then this loop will terminate, which is correct. But here we are only storing the value of remainder. So where is that last digit gonna go? We're going to lose it. In this case, we need to have one last step of processing outside of this while loop. And that one is going to be the value of quotient because at first we only store the remainders. Let me jump back here again. Notice that what we store here, like the final answer, is the list of these remainders reversed. But when we are done, we need to grab the last quotient if necessary. And then finally, we need to reverse our string because like I said here, if you look, we have four, one, five, three, one, but the final answer is reading it backwards. So we have one, three, five, one, three, five here, and then one, four. So that's what they have as the final answer. So to reverse a string in C++, you simply pass it to the reverse function, which is from this algorithm header at the top, and I'm passing the beginning of my string and the end. Now the begin function or the begin method is implemented inside of the string class, and it gives you an iterator to the beginning of the string, whereas the end method will give you an iterator pointing to past the end of the string. I think I've talked about that in many of my previous videos, but if you guys don't understand that, just Google this online or you can ask your questions in the comment section. Now that the string has been reversed, we need to look at whether or not we need to add the negative sign at the beginning of it. So if original decimal here, which is this number, if the original decimal value was in fact less than zero, meaning it was a negative number, I'm going to insert a hyphen at position zero inside of my string. So I'm going to push my other values in my string so that at the first index, which is the beginning of the string, I can add this negative sign. In this case, it's a hyphen. So once we are done, we have our octal string updated, then we can simply return it. And that's it for the entire algorithm here. Pretty simple. Hopefully you guys understood everything. Now we need to test it to make sure that it really works. You don't have to build it manually. You can just press this button here at the top. Um, in this case, it says one up to date because I've already built it previously. Now let's run this. So the first thing is we need to add some inputs. I actually have a monitor, a different one, but I'm just going to push this. And then now I'm going to have this notepad right here. And on the other side of my screen, I will have the rapidtables.com window. So actually let's do it like this here. So now I'm going to scroll all the way at the top 
grab my notepad and we're going to test it with negative 50. So first, let's input that into our program. I'm grabbing negative 50 here. I'm copying it, pasting it in this window. Hopefully you guys can see it. And we get negative 62 at the top here. Actually, let me reverse the window so that you guys can see a bit better just in case. All right, so now we get negative 62. Let me paste this inside of the online tool and we also get negative 62. Let's test it now with negative eight when it's exactly eight and we get negative 10, which is correct. Let's test it here. We also get negative 10. Now when it's zero, we should get the same value, also zero. When it's seven, we should also get the same value because it's less than eight. Now when it's eight, we should get positive 10. So we got positive 10 here. Previously, we got negative 10, which was correct. Now we get positive 10. And now for the more interesting test samples. So we can have 18,000 something. And when we compare, we also have 44766, just like they do, 44766. Now let's test with a number that has multiple digits, like in the millions. We get 75006724. They get 75006724. Now this is a much more interesting number. And we get the same thing. So it starts with 25021, just like us, 25021, and it ends with 426275. 426275 as well. Now this number I think is in the quadrillions, I'm not too sure. But it starts with, I think this is 3000, triple four and two, and it ends with 5713. So they also get 3000, triple four and two, and it ends with 5713. And for the final test case, I think this one is in the quintillions. The results start with 6242131. So they also have 6242131. And then it ends with 430707. Same thing, 430707. And if you look at their steps, they are pretty long. So that's what we computed in the background. And I guess at this point, I consider that this program is working perfectly in terms of accuracy. So that's it for conversion of decimal to octal. I hope you guys like this video. Please subscribe to this channel and I'll see you next time.